Memory is one of the most powerful tools of the adaptive immune response. It is life-saving and it is amazing. And it's something that I think is kind of understudied, um, partially because in kind of the scientific community, there's this old adage that we all hear as we're coming up through the ranks, publish or perish. And if you actually tried to figure out how long memory T cells stay alive, you would likely perish before the memory T cells did. I know, bad immunology joke. But they are actually important, and the way that they are created is actually very interesting. So we're gonna talk about how do we make a memory T cell response, and how do we save these T cells from the incredible culling that happens at the end of an acute immune response. So memory T cells are produced during the encounter with the specific activating antigen from the pathogen that are presented on MHC molecules during the normal initial priming event. These guys are made in addition to the effector cells. Okay, so in any immune response, you have your T cell here that's getting activated. You have a multitude of effector cells that are made but then you also have a couple of memory cells that are going to be more long-lived. Um, for a T helper cell, the effector cells are those that are going to um, secrete cytokine, uh, kill things. There are the ones that are going to actually do something about the pathogen. The memory cells are really kind of the historians. They're long-lived and they're present in small numbers and they have very limited effector function. We're not really sending them into the fray, um, but we still need to make them so that next time we can make more effector cells in a faster fashion. So let's talk about how that works. So really, I've talked before about the importance of this cytokine, um, IL-7. IL-7, um, the last time we really talked about it was when we talked about actually creating lymphocytes, that IL-7 is really important in the bone marrow and in the thymus for actually kind of pushing the survival of these cells along. Well, it's also really important for maintaining memory T cells when antigen is absent. So I want you to think of IL-7 um, and IL-2. So when we talk about creating an immune response, I tell you that IL-2 is a feast. Now, previously I've called it a Thanksgiving feast. Now I wanna kinda of change the parameters a bit. IL-2 is a junk food feast. It's like a late night freezer pizza, candy and popcorn binge feast feast. Um, it's fast food. It's not healthy, but it'll get the job done if you're looking for something quick and delicious. Um, IL-7 is like eating a really healthy diet, you know, brown rice, chicken without the skin on it, vegetables, all of those things that, you know, we know we should be eating, but maybe we don't all of the time, okay? So, IL-7 is going to allow for a longer lifestyle, lifetime, presumably the same way if I ate more vegetables and less chocolate, I would also have a longer lifetime. Um, so it's really not that different. So if we think about a naive T cell, a naive T cell has really high levels of the IL-7 receptor because, you know, most parents try to feed their kids healthy foods. And it has kind of low uh, expression of the IL-2 receptor. As it becomes activated, the ones that are going to become effector cells actually decrease expression of the IL-7 receptor and have a significant increase in the IL-2 receptor expression. So they lose their IL-7 in favor of the quickly available IL-2 that is being pumped out by those effector CD4 cells as they're made. Because remember, the amount of IL-2 that's present in the acute environment is very, very high, okay? But in a normal kind of homeostatic time, when, you know, there aren't any antigens and like, you know, on days when you feel like really good and healthy, you've got very little IL-2, okay? So 
cells still need to eat. So during an acute event, there's actually not very much IL-7. But during homeostatic times, IL-7 is doing great. It's really come up in the world. There's a lot of it. So during an acute event, these effector cells have upregulated the IL-2 receptor in favor of the IL-2 rich food source that's available. Cells that are going to become memory cells actually maintain their IL-7 receptor and only have a very slight increase to actually no increase in their IL-2 receptor. They go, yeah, this IL-2 thing seems like a fad. I'm going to hold out for the good food that I know is going to come back later. So then as the immune response dies and IL-2 is low, we get a lot more IL-7 back and these memory cells are maintained and the effector cells essentially die of starvation. All right, so how can we differentiate an effector cell from a memory cell? Well, the answer is CD45. Now, CD45 is expressed in a variety of different forms, but it's expressed on naive cells, effector cells, and memory cells. However, these there are these kind of splice variants where certain segments are cleaved out of it, okay? So there's different appearance, appearances for CD45. So you can have CD45RA or CD45RO, okay? A good way to remember this is that CD45RA has all of its subunits, whereas CD45RO had some cut out, all right? So CD45RA is found in naive T cells, whereas CD45RO is found in effector or mem or re cells. So that's pretty much the whole thing. If it's got CD45RO, it's either a memory cell or an effector cell. If it's a naive cell, it has CD45RA. Now, there is one other thing I should tell you about memory. There are actually two types of T memory cells. There's central memory cells and there's effector memory cells. Both of these T cell types are long-lived because they're memory cells. The effector cells have slightly higher functionality and they actually traffic around the body kind of throughout it, okay? The central cells have actually no function, really, except to recognize antigen. And they actually stay put in kind of the lymphoid tissue. So these guys go out into the world and try to find the pathogen again. And if they do, they have a couple things at their disposal. They can secrete a few cytokines. They can, um, you know, go out into the world and make some quick responses that will kind of help until the immune response really gets going. But they're not going to live as long as the central memory cells. The central memory cells are going to be really, really long lived, but they don't go anywhere. So they're only going to encounter the pathogen if it comes into the lymphoid tissue. So the biggest thing about memory is that it's fast. Memory T cell responses are very much like memory B cell responses. During the secondary challenge to antigen, effector T cell responses have a shorter lag time. So in the primary infection, you get exposed here, and it's something like two to three weeks before you really hit your stride in an immune response. In a secondary immune response, you get exposed to the pathogen here, and within hours to days, you know, two to three days, you've got a really strong immune response happening. Um, the differences between memory T cells and memory B cells are that memory T cell responses are terminated rapidly following clearance of antigen and affinity of the TCR for the peptide does not change or increase like it does with B cells. Um, you can see that the frequency of the effector T cells and the titer of the antibody peaks about two weeks after the infection. And this period between 
when it's exposed and when it peaks and exposed and peaks is known as lag time. Um, so there's during this secondary immune response, you're going to get there a lot faster.